four, three, two, one. We are recording. Hey there, Stephen Oliver again. I'm joined by performance coach uh, Lee, Lee. Your your bio is way too long for me to recite in in total. But you have I don't know. You used to have your own TV show. Uh, you're a, a high level performance coach. You've worked with everybody from NASA to an awful lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners uh, like the the group that we're working with. Um, you are the um, uh, lead of the coaching programs for uh, uh, for Dan Kennedy's organization, GKIC, for many, many, many years. Pick up from there a little bit. I uh, um, And by the way, I, I have to always remember, uh, remind you, we've known each other since the 80s because we met in Boulder, Colorado when you were still with Career Track. And yeah, I was 11. Did you know I was 11 years old then? <laughs> you were 11. I, w- I must have been nine or, 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 uh, or, or 12 or something like that. And uh, in truth, I already had six martial arts schools in Denver, Colorado at that point. It was uh, in the habit of bringing all my staff to uh, anything I could find, including those big success seminars and the career track things and every other thing. Yes, I, I've been around for a couple of days. Um, I am very pleased that I have uh, my niche in life really is just entre- entrepreneurs. My niche is people who want to have a growth mindset and make money and contribute to the world. So um, unfortunately, there's a lot less of those, but for the people who are out there, they are doing a great job. They're curious, they're open-minded, but they're learners. And those are the kind of people that I thrive with. Uh, If I get around people who are, you know, got the blinders on, refuse to look at, you know, reality from any other perspective, I really know that they're not my tribe, so to speak. And we've been working together. Not only have we known each other this long, um, I don't have my Rolex on today. I didn't think of you. I am. Oh, you got your, you got your, I've got my uh, Omega on today. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, I I remember the first time you came up to me and you you pointed your your Rolex to me and I pointed my Rolex at you and then we bonded. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, we had the, the, the male and female version of the presidential. Uh, That's I, think, correct. I think both with diamond faces, if I That's remember right. correctly. That's yeah. right. So I'm a big believer in that there are no limitations in life other than the ones that we allow to hamper us. Yeah. And that there's always a solution. And that the only way that we all succeed as entrepreneurs is truly get out of the lane that we were in and look for a different way to see life because there's a lot more obstacles than there used to be. But even with obstacles, there's ways around it. There's yeah. there's fixes. There's, and it's all about mindset, to be honest. Right. right. Well, you 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 just hit upon our uh, uh, what I think our primary topic will be today is the difference between uh, having blinders on and really being able to see the world, and um, the financial advisor industry, the finance industry, however you want to phrase it. You know, life producers. Uh, it, there, there's a lot of ways to uh, to frame it. But it's it's worse than anything I've ever seen as far as having blinders on and having a very narrow worldview of what's possible. I, I was going to share two or three things here to begin with. And and by the way, we're going to talk about my new book and your new book and your contribution to my book and and um, and all of that. But but l- l- let me share first from our mutual friend uh, and mentor, uh, Dan Kennedy. And let me uh, let me see if I can uh, figure out how to do this properly. Um, here we go. Uh, I received this, uh, well, just, uh, last week. And, uh, this I think really illustrates what, what I am talking about. He says right here in the, um, uh, the second line, many are trapped in a sales model and doing things they do not like to do much the same as they were 10 or 20 years earlier in their career. Uh, and Stephen Oliver's book dismantles all this brilliantly and directs very different, more sophisticated thinking about self-marketing. Maybe back up a step, he says, I'm perpetually surprised how comparatively primitive even its high six-figure income professionals are about marketing, thus making their attraction of clients much harder than it needs to be. Well, that kind of, that kind of nails what we're talking about, doesn't it? A a, a million percent. Yeah. Um, I've had my most experience with financial uh, marketers and financial planners when uh, I ran peak performers for 12 years with Bill Glazer and Dan Kennedy. Yeah. And then I ran Renegade with Adam Witte. And here's what I discovered. Adam Witte of uh, Forbes Books. 
Yeah, yes, uh, from, yeah. yes, from Forbes books. And that's very important to know because that yeah. was hard earned, I'm sure. Yeah. So what I found was that these financial planners came into the groups and they were completely besottenly brainwashed mm -hmm. by their industry of what they couldn't do. Yeah. That everything they did, it was it was like checking with the powers that be they acted like scolded children mm -hmm. that if they step over the line in any way, you know, this big hammer was going to come down on them. So for all these years that I did that, you know, my main focus was to question, why aren't you pushing the envelope a little bit? Uh, and, and you're not standing out to any of the people around you. You're not attracting clients who really want a creative, fresh look at life. You're sticking to the old road, which is worn out and tired and exhausted. And I will honestly tell you that the financial planners who thrive because they were in our groups, they adapted sort of the Dan Kennedy and your marketing strategies. You know, they stepped out of that very narrow focus and they took some risk. But I mean, they stayed in the... Uh, the lane enough that, you know, nobody was going to kick them out of the business. But yeah. the advantage to them was the acceleration of number of clients that were attracted to them. Yeah. And um, I still have some of those private clients today. And, um, you know, they thank me all the time about removing the veil, they call it. Yeah. Of yeah. what can be and, you know, what we're told can be. So I, uh, for all you financial planners out there today, there's a lot more money, a lot more ease, a lot more joy by, you know, paving your own road than it is sticking to things that used to be. And I like this, uh, old keys don't open new doors. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. It's not mine, but I love it. Yeah. And that's yeah. and that's where we are. It's And don't go to the, if you're going to the tried and the true, that means that there's 4 million of people doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. How will you distinguish yourself? How do you stand out from that? Yeah. And so that's the mindset you have to have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always come back to Earl Nightingale's quote, which is, if you don't have a, a, a format for success, look around at what everybody else in the industry is doing and do the opposite. Right. And, and here's, here's a, a, a yet no, another example directly from the industry here. Again, let's see how uh, uh, efficient I am in, uh, in sharing this. Here we go. Uh, this is a pretty high profile uh, person um, in the industry here. As soon as I managed to get it to uh, actually show up here. There we go. This is Ken Fisher uh, from his book, uh, The Ten Roads to Riches. And notice what he says. When my firm started doing direct mail marketing for high net worth individual industry experts said we were nuts ditto when we started internet direct marketing wouldn't couldn't work no one would respond to advertising like that and become clients next came radio print ads and tv they all worked which is how we built my firm but most everyone in the know thought we were daft i love that most everyone in the know thought we were daft and then he goes on to say when we uh roll it out outside of the United States. They all thought he was daft as well. Um, and, and again, that's a, a great indication. There's some, uh, I, I believe you were there. I, I was there in a small group with Adam Whitty and, uh, and Dan Kennedy as they hosted um, uh, Ken Fisher. And he basically said, you know, as I was growing my company, when I got some pretty good mass, I was worried about everybody knocking me off. And then I realized that they all had these blinders that uh, had already concluded that what he was doing wouldn't work for them. And to, to unpack what you said a minute ago, uh, Lee, is one is there's this fear of compliance. And it's one of those things that's a very real fear that ends up being, you know, for want of a better word, catastrophized, right? There's, there's a fear of running afoul of FINRA, running afoul of the SEC, of running afoul of the actual authorities. And and fearing that they really can't do anything because of quote unquote compliance. And then the set, which, which is, is a real fear that's blown into this massive boogeyman rather than into the, uh, the reality of, of what it all is all about, as you were saying. 
The, the second element is what uh, Dan's old partner, Bill Glazier, used to call the sales prevention department. So, you know, the, the big companies all have a raft of attorneys and all these other people who end up being the sales prevention department, uh, telling the advisors what they can and cannot do. And, you know, they, they are perhaps well-intentioned, well-meaning and well-educated, but they really are, are way, 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 way too narrowly focused and have no sense of anything other than go pick up the phone and do cold calls as far as their, uh, their marketing efforts. There's an old saying, it's called what you focus on expands. Yep. And this is the, what you just said is a real example of that, Stephen, in the sense of it appears to me that the majority of the financial advisors focus on what they cannot do, which, of course, if you are into creativity and scanning the landscape of what will work, that completely shuts that down. Your brain refuses to even see it. And the bottom line is, is that money is, is just a symbol and energy and that it goes to where it is appreciated. And that, that sounds strange to people, but it really is true. And that, you know, I think a lot of these financial advisors have this mental manual job in their heads. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, you know, and I, this is what I do. This is the formula. And I do ABC, ABC, ABC. And maybe that worked in 1950. <laughs> maybe it worked in 1960, but it's certainly not working today. And one of the things that, um, you know, I think all of us should pay attention to is what, when you're looking in your life for, you know, some kind of advisor on anything, whether it's a physician or financial or anything, you want to look at somebody who is on the same page as you. Right. Now, if your clients are all the, you know, follow the rules and afraid to do anything, uh, you can still work with those, but you're going to work with diminishing clients because the world right now is expanding. It has to expand. Uh, again, you know, old keys are not opening new doors. And what all of us have to do is look at our clients and say, how can I be the person that they're looking for? And most of them aren't developing their own personality. They're not using, you know, any of the, you know, as I know you and I've talked about, they use, they have like a sales program. They, mm -hmm. They're salespeople, but you have to be an, an influencer. If you think instead of being a salesperson, you have to be an influencer of like, you're showing, you're showing this stuff. Um, I do have a client who's very, in, in, and I've had her for three years. She's a CPA. She's also a financial advisor. And everything I suggest to her, the first thing she says is, no, 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 we can't do that. Yeah. I always say, well, what if you could find a way around that? What if you could do a workaround? I mean, how can, I mean, even in her newsletter, she won't do the most simplest little things because she's so afraid of the compliance. Mm -hmm. And this year, after three years, it's taken three full years to get her to finally try something new. She tried it. And then within three months, she was stunned at the number of new clients that she got by making these small but effective changes. Oh, absolutely. And the, um, you know, the, the, the other thing that happens is, is by being so fearful, these guys all end up in the no worse than anybody else syndrome. I, I remember I picked that up from Tom Peters many, many years ago. As he said, you know, most companies are acting like their, their marketing differentiator is we're no worse than anybody else. And nobody's attracted to that. That's, that's, that's not what I'm attracted to. I, I want to be attracted to somebody who has personality, who has gravitas, who is willing to take a stand, who is willing to stand out above the crowd. It's, you know, the, the um, you know, first couple of chapters of, of my new book, and we'll talk about that, uh, is all about be different from the crowd, not be the same as the crowd. Uh, find ways to differentiate yourself. What's interesting about yourself? You know, in your case, you have uh, you have your painting behind there uh, in in your beautiful home right on the beach in Virginia Beach. Uh, you know, I have a hundred elk in my backyard and at eight thousand foot elevation in in Colorado. Well, you know, they're, they're kind of trivia points of of where we happen to live. But most advisors, they don't even want to share what are their hobbies. You know, what are their kids doing? What uh, uh, I have one who's into motorcycles and one that's into Porsches. Well, 
okay, let's make the office with the glass wall and let's put your Porsche collection on that side and have the conference room overlooking. And, you know, let's, let's have something unique about you that they can then identify. And guess what? You'll, you'll, you'll attract more people who both appreciate that you're unique and appreciate, but you also attract people who are, who are similar to you, who are in a comparable income bracket or who are uh, uh, appreciative of, of that level of, of just uniqueness. So that reminds me uh, years ago, Dan Kennedy uh, talked about being uh, diabetic, alcoholic, uh, that he had had bankruptcy problems, uh, his car got repossessed. You know, there was all these sundry of things. And right. I was new to his world at the time. And I was like, probably sitting next to you going, oh my God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, showing all these flaws. Right. And later I said to him, well, one that was kind of ballsy to do that. And he said, oh, that wasn't ballsy at all. It was completely on target. And, and I said, why? And he said, well, because think of the number of people who've been bankrupt, who had their cards, who, you know, divorce or this or that. And he said, all of a sudden I bond with those people because, you know, I'm teaching these things, but I've had these problems that I've overcome. He said, every time I can put a new category in there, then that somehow bonds me to people. So you're absolutely right about if you're into motorcycles or Porsches or things like that. I mean, like the motorcycle world is huge. Oh yeah. And and the Porsche world is huge. I mean, um, I you know I think one of the things I'm known for is like you know I like jewelry. So you know just think about I mean if people if women see me men could care less but the women who see me are like. Well, she must be doing something right. Look at all this jewelry she has. Now, just so you know, I buy it for myself. But anyway, right. oh, yeah, right. that's okay. Uh, I can do that. But Or I point it out and have somebody buy it for me. But every little thing that we can do that expresses our personality, whether it's artwork or living at the beach or you know living in a beautiful place like you do, in some way connects people on an emotional level that they will feel more bonded to you, more connected to you or appreciate that you've had these problems and overcame them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and even more so than that, I believe is, is the next level that people want to do business with humans. They don't do business with faceless corporations. And if you look at in this industry, the, again, I used Ken Fisher as an example, Ken Fisher's advertising is completely different than all the big companies. Because the big companies, they don't have a face. Uh, they don't have a personality. They don't have a voice. And the advisors that are working with them uh, do their best to replicate that generic, um, you know, no different than anybody else syndrome, which is, which is death. There's just, it's, it's just unbelievable. But, you know, that, that was what my rule when I founded my first company way back, you know, in um, dating myself here, 1983 is I realized very quickly that people don't want to deal with a faceless bureaucracy. They want to deal with humans. They want to deal with other people that they can relate to. They want to deal with people who have similar backgrounds, similar interests, similar uh, desires, or have unique hobbies of, of things they could do. Uh, an example I use in my, my book is, you know, Dan Kennedy, you, you mentioned Dan, he's got that great picture of him sitting on a damn longhorn steer. And, you know, it's like, well, what, what the hell is that all about? Right. And it's, it's the no BS um, um, moniker, but you know, who else is, you know, is sitting in a, in a, in a business suit with a tie on, on, a, on a steer, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to remember that one, right. Uh, uh, Jerry Spence, the famous attorney, you know, all the pictures of him were always in the uh, suede jacket with the tassels. And I think he lived in the, you know, at a ranch in, in Wyoming or something, but it was these people that you remember something interesting about them. They stood out from the crowd. They, um, you probably read uh, Tim Ferriss's book years ago, um, uh, The Four Hour Work Week. Awful lot about the book that I didn't think was very valuable. But what I what I what I liked about the book, among others, was he had this picture, the avatar of what he didn't want to be, and it was the bald headed fat guy in the red BMW convertible, and the avatar of that was. Here's somebody who had waited 50 years in their life before they ever had, you know, any of the re rewards of, of their labor rather than having the rewards along the way. 
But in dealing with now hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of financial advisors, we start thinking of them all as being in the JCPenney suit sitting behind the oak desk. You know, they all, they all have the same look, the same feel, the same conversation. And there's just most of them, there's nothing interesting uh, about them at all or else the things that are interesting about them, they hide behind the, the wall there. I, I, that's all. That's <clears throat> incredibly true. Um, I did have a financial advisor who took my advice in the um, in the Renegade Millionaire. I I I I said to him, "How many people who are your competitors in your town are finding great books and sending those books out to potential customers?" And he says, "Well, I don't really know, but I don't think any." Mm -hmm. And he actually each month sends literally a hundred books out. Now they're not very big books and he right. bought them at a very good price. Sure. But he said to me, he said, that has, uh, he said, not only have I sent the book out, he said, at least once a month, I, you know, maybe they haven't done business with me at all, but I'm drilling away into their subconscious mind that I am a guy who has information, that I care about them, and I'm willing to share the information. And he said, you know, this is this is a um, this isn't a sprint. This is a marathon that you have to be consistent and be doing things that brings value. So for anybody in who's listening today, I mean, Stephen Oliver's book. Uh, you know, is I'm, I'm in the book, so I'm a little prejudiced and biased. Sure, but, you're, you're you're a contributor <laughs> as well as a. Uh... But, uh, but I've read the book and uh, I love the, the version, the flip version of the book. That was really great. I'm going to ask you how to do that. But um, I, you got to think of how you can, uh, like when you go, like if you go to there hypothetically, um, there we go. And this book, uh, I mean, you have to read the book, but there, there are processes in this book that if you just follow these processes, and it's not rocket science, it's not brain surgery, you'll be, you're gonna be able to attract people you couldn't attract before. Uh, I think there's something interesting happening in the world today. I, I really do believe that we have a lack of trust for people who have said they were for our highest and best. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into that, but everybody knows what I'm talking about, but we've been betrayed by uh, government, we've been betrayed by industries, we've been betrayed repeatedly, we've been sold stuff that's not true. So you've got to be the person who is the producer, who when you give advice, people listen. Mm -hmm. And that also depends on how much you believe in yourself. And that whole mindset part of if you're wanting to be a financial advisor, but secretly you are feeling very insecure and not clear about yourself. You're repelling people. You're not attracting people. And one of the greatest ways, instead of selling, I want you to remove the word selling out of your mind because selling and financial advice is wrong. You should be an educator, mm -hmm. meaning that, okay, if you want a bond or you want stocks or you want whatever it is you want, you know, let me educate you and match your needs with the product's needs or the product's delivery. And, and I know a lot of you have a lot of negative thoughts about selling because from the time you were a child, uh, the media decided that they couldn't pick on very few people publicly, but they did pick on salespeople. Mm -hmm. And because there was no big union or something, you know, where salespeople got together and fought the media. But if you looked at just a sitcom where they made, they made buffoons out of salespeople and, and you look at how you're not aware that that repetitive message over and over and over actually got into your subconscious mind. So I really, I mean, I've written a book on sales and I really say, look, you know, when you say sales to someone, most of the time they, you know, their energy goes down. But if you say I can educate you on this or I can give you, you know, data and information to make very good informed decisions that could be uh, profitable, you know, I'm sure you'd be interested in that. So it, it but first you got to clean up yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't clean up yourself, uh, you have that imposter syndrome thing going on. And so many people 
who are working in the financial industry actually feel like they're imposters yeah. because their yeah. whole life is a mess themselves. Mm -hmm. So it, if you do the right thing, I mean, it's easy to clean yourself up, but pay very close attention to your own self-talk um, and, and your own intentions and what do you think is going to happen in the future? And where are you out of balance? If you get yourself into balance and you really feel good about yourself, you automatically attract people. I mean, Stephen, you and I have sat in a lot of audiences where there's uh, people on stage and they're really good until they get to the sales part and then they completely then they fall apart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, they're all smiling and happy. And as soon as they start selling on stage, they get very freaked out and their energy level is very off. And then they're surprised that nobody goes in the back room and orders anything. So I believe that great sales is a matter of how much are you in great integrity with your intentions towards that person. And of course, our intentions has to be, we want to be of the best service possible. Mm -hmm. And when you think like that, you feel free to share information that will help people. And it's, you'll, you'll pursue them appro appropriately. Um, you know, for the, you just before we started recording, I told you something I was trying to sell somebody that nothing, right. nothing I could do to sell them on. Don't do that. <laughs> and, you know, now, you know, maybe they'll look back at me and remember, I doubt it, but, you know, we, we have to do the right thing. So uh, if you're not constantly reading books about your self-talk and your intentions and your mindset and things like that, then you're going to miss a little part of the big success you can have in life. We only rise in life to what we believe is possible. And I believe that most financial advisors also don't set their goals high enough. Oh, absolutely. They've let the news completely put a pin in their balloon. Yeah. Well, a, a, a client and a friend who is, a, a, you know, a, a strong seven figure earner. So he's, he's well into the million and a half, two million a year net income. Uh, having the similar tax um, um, issues that you and I have of uh, writing incredibly big checks uh, every quarter. But uh, uh, we were talking about that and talking about the way that uh, the people are thinking about it. And in a, in a period like now where, where, the, where the economy is, is uh, in all kinds of turmoil, his comment was almost all the advisors are cowering under their desk, afraid to talk to their clients. And you know, and this was back, uh, the first conversation was back when the COVID thing hit and the, the market crashed. And I said, well, what we should be doing is we should be doing a series of webinars and teleseminars and Zoom meetings and getting everybody in the group. And we should have a, you know, a weekly newsletter going out to them and, a, you know, constant communication. And he said, well, that's so interesting because most people do the exact opposite. Most people do at, uh, at a time they're afraid of their clients um, bailing out or complaining about their re re results. They hide under the desk. It is just the exact opposite of, of, of what you should be doing. As far as um, thinking in terms of potential, see, it's amazing how advisors go after, you know, it's not even the mass affluent. It's kind of like they, they get this, this sense in their mind of everybody needs what I do. It's like, well, okay, but, you know, your, your, your mission is, is to help those that you can have the highest leverage with have the highest income with. I know um, we were talking about you finally sold your office building, but the signs all over your office uh, were always follow the money. Well, you know, that's, that's my focus is what, you know, how do we move the quality of your uh, prospective clients up um, uh, a couple of notches? How do we add a couple of zeros to their income and to their asset base? How do we, maybe we, uh, let's pursue um, uh, 50 year old entrepreneurs who have built a $20 million business and catch them prior to uh, having a liquidity event, I catch them prior to selling it. Uh, one of my clients, that's specifically what we're doing is we're talking to business brokers, we're talking to uh, various people who are in the involved with sales of business. And he just closed a, a deal with an existing client where he added 20 million assets under management in one day. Well, most advisors are happy to do that in a year or two. Uh, well, this was one check. It's it's much, uh, it's frankly much easier to do that. Is to uh, chase down big opportunities than it is to uh, to look for, you know, a whole bunch of minnows and hope they add up to something. Oh my gosh! If that was ever more of a truth, I can't believe it. Yes, years ago, I uh, I I had a business. It was called Background Music Services, Tidewater, and it was basically 
my company put in music systems and sound systems and intercoms and phones and businesses. And so it was a continuity business, which was great. And it was five years and then it renewed itself. So it was a very good business. However, I soon realized that dealing with the tiny mom and pops, you know, the little dentist on the corner of the shopping center, you know, this was arduous. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned very quickly, let me go to chains like uh, a grocery store chain, a drugstore chain. Let me go work with shopping center development. And it took me a little bit longer, you know, to get in the loop and to mm -hmm. get to see them. But I'm persistent. If nothing else in life, I am persistent. Mm -hmm. And then I could make huge deals with, you know, 50 stores at the same time versus trying to deal with the little you know, you know, the dentist whose wife was, you know, complaining that, you know, he was spending money on, you know, intercoms or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I always tell people, it's like, don't be shy about uh, going to big people uh, that really smart people are hungry and they notice and observe someone who knows things they don't know. I yeah. mean, uh, every successful, I mean, look at just successful people. They're looking for ways to save time, save money, save energy. And if you have a solution for them and that you're straightforward and, you know, that the energy feels right, they're going to want to deal with you. So go for the big guys. I mean, again, it, it's worth it. Oh, absolutely. And uh, they're much less. See, I, I think I think people think the opposite. They think that they're going to be more nitpicky and they're, you know, they're so much more educated. They're going to be more discerning. Well, no, a, a, a seven-figure earner like us is I, I want to find somebody I feel comfortable with who knows things that I want to do. If I have a video project, I'm not going to nitpick what camera they're using. I'm going to be, you know, let's get this done. Like, mm -hmm. here, here's my criteria. Can you do it? Fine. And they're not nearly as discerning about expense, about fees, about everything else, because they appreciate somebody who knows what they're doing, appreciates. And I mean, I very rarely uh, beat somebody up on price if I think they're competent. Somebody who I'm, I'm uh, reluctant to deal with at all, but they're just the only one I've come across. They're the ones I beat them up on price. Uh, the ones who are competent, who present themselves as, as on top of what they're doing. Okay, your price is your price. That's fine. I don't want to beat you up enough that you're going to feel like you have to compromise on quality because I, I know what it is I want. And if you can do it, you can do it, right? I mean, that's, that's really what happens. And again, you know, these little bread and butter clients, great. And sure, you know, there's an awful lot of people with a great deal of need, but there's a huge universe of whales and there's a huge universe of people who are going to multiply, uh, again, the, you know, assets under management. There's a huge number of people who can give you. And again, I use the example of, uh, of Fisher. Well, all over their ads, you know, every, everything branded on their ads is if you have half a million or more here's the things that you should be aware of. Well, what does that mean? If you don't have half a million or more, don't darken our door. And so they're very clear on who it is they're looking for and very clear on what the criteria is and are bringing in, are, are they're feeding thousands of advisors through direct response marketing. So I, I um, you and I have discussed this in detail over dinner many nights about yeah. really, what we're really talking about, Stephen, is low self-esteem on the part of the people who are financial planners. They believe in lack. Uh, they're, ru they're running from fear. They have imaginary conversations in their head and imaginary situations. Uh, they assume things they shouldn't assume. But really the bottom line is they have been captured by mainstream media, not just on the news. I mean, it's in movies, it's in television shows. Um, you know, where, again, people make fun of financial planners, yep. they make fun of salespeople, uh, they're, they're very negative towards them. And so somehow or another, uh, financial planners always feel like, I mean, I, they feel like they're less than. Oh, yeah. you've, you've got to have just the opposite view. You've got to feel like you're hot. You've got to feel like you, you're the guy or the woman who can absolutely break through a lot of the clutter. You can see opportunities. You can bring, you know, new perspectives to the, to the deal. I, you know, 
both of us know, like when a person uh, goes on stage, you can really tell in the first 30 seconds, does this person believe in what they're saying? Mm -hmm. You know, there's all kinds of visual uh, body language. There's tonality. There's also, as Napoleon Hill talked about in his book, that uh, brains were like uh, radio stations mm -hmm. and that the subconscious mind is always communicating. So people who don't believe in themselves, no matter what bravo you're putting on in the world, if you don't believe in yourself and you haven't convinced yourself that you're good enough, uh, it's going to show up. Yeah. And so that that's the basis for, I don't care what you do in life. Uh, I mean, think of your, your martial arts schools. You know, everybody has to start off as, you know, pathetic and, you know, terrified. I'm going to get my butt kicked here. Or, are you going to hit my face? You know, it's all those fears. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's this process of gaining confidence and then techniques and skills. And you build and you build and you build. And that's what all of us who want to thrive in the future. Um, I, I am now not, I mean, you can't not see the news. I mean, if you just go to a bank, they're playing for the love of God, CNN, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and they're playing stuff that's like, really, this is like killing you, but you're playing it in your, in your lobby. Um, I, but, you know, if anything happens, I know I don't even have to know the news because you just flip through LinkedIn or Facebook or something and there's the information. Mm -hmm. But my always question is, bad things have happened. Where is the leverage for me? What is it I can do to leverage this bad situation into a good situation? Where is my opening? And, you know, everybody's afraid of change, but change is the most constant thing there is. And I do want to remind everybody that uh, we're going through a real destruction of reality, um, sadly. Yeah. However, all new births have to have destruction. All new things have to have destruction. So we need to tear down whatever the hell it is you're doing and thinking and feeling that's literally holding you back. And I want to tell you the core of this. Most people think all power is external. And there is external power. I consider the IRS very high external power. The <laughs> but, FBI, yeah. The FBI, the, the IRS. You know, that's external. But however, the average people are fighting dragons and stuff that it's their own mindset of. Mm -hmm. They think, oh, I should call this person, but oh, they're too rich. They won't have any time for me. Just give it a shot. The worst thing that can happen is they say no. And no is the beginning of every sale. Oh, absolutely. No means absolutely nothing to, as you well know, no, oh, yeah. no doesn't yeah. mean anything to me yeah. other than now I have knowledge mm -hmm. of where and what I need to do to help this person, this client, this customer, whatever it is, because I already know, I know your weakness. Yeah. I know your, your biases. I know your fears. And then I can work on that instead of just giving up. Yeah. Having, uh, having uh, uh, essentially memorized everything that Zig Ziglar and Tom, uh, Tom Hopkins said, you know, back in the eighties, uh, I always like Tom Hopkins quote, no is just a request for more information. And it is. Yeah. Yeah. But the, my uh, father said no to me for everything I asked, which meant nothing to me. Like, okay, well, here's he used to call me the Philadelphia lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I could find a reason why I could do this. Yeah, that's 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 my 14-year-old. The <laughs> um <laughs> he's very good at it. Uh you you mentioned something here that just really, really resonated with me. I have uh two different clients. Uh, one of which is uh, Canadian and um, uh, in the Toronto area. And he has a number of circles of friends, associates, um, groups that he's involved with, with very rich people, very influential people and very and people who respect him a lot. And he just never would ask them or tell them about what hit business he was in or take the next step to pursue a relationship with them or to pursue, pursue the networks. And then I have another one who's in similar circles that you are, where they're uh, speaking to the, uh, uh, the various conservative groups and have a podcast and one thing or another. And it's like they were afraid to mention their business and to address their business in, in their circles. And I, I, 
I always think that it's a combination of just not enough sincere interest in the other person, because if the value that you're going to bring to the table is a dramatic impact on their life, why do you want to de you know, de deprive them of the opportunity to learn how to accomplish the things that only you know how to do for them? And combine that with, as you said, the imposter syndrome, or, or maybe it's a lack of self-esteem. I don't know what it is. I think oftentimes they think, well, my role here is going to be blemished if I bring business into it. Well, no. I mean, what your, what your role is, is to help their life be Im improved, to help their wealth grow, to help, their, uh, help them accomplish their financial goals. Won't their life be improved if you help them achieve the goals that they're attempting to achieve? And it's just, it's just amazing how often that comes up. Well, I'm involved with this. And well, what, what are you doing to, to benefit uh, them through your knowledge base? Well, nothing. Why? Because I didn't want to really talk business with them. <laughs> well, let's see. If you're if, like, like if you're a baker and you're just making bread every day, I understand that. But um, I used to use uh, a phrase that I still use occasionally, and that is when I would meet people and and I'm I'm pretty assertive. Nobody ever thinks I'm a you know a shy person. Actually, I am incredibly shy socially, but I feel very strong in business. So that's where I live my life. But here's the phrase I use. I can would you be interested if I could help you make more money? And if, you know, in that phrase alone, and you can pretty it up, yeah. but would you be interested, you know, to get together with me if I could help you make more money? And you can you make that like, if I could help you increase your portfolio, or if I could help you have more secure investment, but you can pretty it all up. Sure. But that's the bottom line. When I use that phrase, and I wrote it down earlier today, uh, when we were talking, there's no one who said no to me about that. Oh, sure. No one. Sure. And because I, I went in there with, okay, um, this, you know, let me ask you some questions so I can take your needs and, and match with what I have. And let's see if that's a match. And if I'm not a match, I'll be the first person to say so yeah. because I have integrity. Uh, again, I'm in for, as you know, we're in for the long haul. Oh, you we're bet. not, we're not. We're just not blowing in and, you know, grabbing, you know, what do they call it? The money grab. Sure. We're not money grabbers. No, it's not, it's not a, it's not a short-term hit that leaves a bad taste in their mouth. Right. No, because, you know, I'm here for the long haul. And I always say, you know, look, Google me. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. And none of it's where people have sued me or, you know, I've taken advantage or I've been connected with questionable people. Uh, you know, I keep myself very clean in my reputation uh, because truthfully, I have high integrity and I yeah. want to help people because yeah. I believe in this thing called karma. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and if I cheat people, people are going to cheat me. You know, what you sow, you reap. So yeah. if people would take this position of, again, I'm an educator, I'm I'm of service to you uh, and I think it's insane that people are afraid to tell other people, you know, that they're in business. I mean, how would restaurants survive if, you know, there wasn't a sign out at the door saying, you know, we serve food. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I, I, I was using the example with both of these. Uh, uh, and you and I have talked about this before, you know, during my, my years here in, uh, in Colorado working, and developing my own businesses, I ended up with a relationship with the top three biggest employers in the in the state. At the time, uh, two of them were U.S. West and Coors Brewery. Um, U.S. West is now CenturyLink and no longer based in Colorado, but they had 45,000 employees at the time. I had direct ties with the HR and the, the various C-suite people and basically ended up in that company being able to do anything I wanted to market through their their employee base and their executives. Same thing with Coors and same thing with several others. I ended up with C-suite executives for the Denver Broncos and the Denver Nuggets, able to do anything I wanted through those organizations. Um, the, um, um, the executive director uh, for Paul Mitchell Products, executive director for um, uh, McDonald's in, in this region, ended up with relationships with them and were able to, to do anything I wanted as well as a number of pro players and different things. But once you really target 
you find out who somebody is and that that's i think part of it or uh you know chet holmes old thing uh may you rest in peace was the uh, dream 100 list right is you know find your dream 100 who would who would be the best people that you'd love to work with and target them but that's what i did for years and and to a great extent they would come in as clients and then i would figure out who they were and then figure out what a win-win was another one was the uh, i had all of the the c-suite executives of uh 780 million dollar electronics chain that again let us do basically anything we wanted once they figured out how it was going to be a a win-win for them and there's so many opportunities it the 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 main thing i think people are wired to see problems they're not wired to see opportunities i was um uh, in washington dc with uh with a client and you know they were complaining about where they were at and they were on k street in washington dc you know the area um which is right outside of chinatown i said well let's just go walk around the block you you, you think there's uh, you know opportunities missing so i pull out zillow i said those condos right there one bedroom selling for 1.2 million um i think there's some money a- around here don't you think uh let's look at the cars going by porsche 911 mercedes maybach rolls I, th- I i think there's some money here Let's go stand in line at Starbucks. And I literally went through a line of 20 people and said, prospect, 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 maybe not prospect, prospect, but they just had blinders on. They couldn't see opportunity all around them when it was just, it was just evident that it, that it was, you know, everywhere you looked, there was opportunity. Well, see, one of the things that's really great about you is you show up and you're seen and you show up at a lot of different type of venues. Mm -hmm. They're not just entrepreneurial venues, you know, they're business venues. And um, I really believe you have to be seen in the world. You cannot just hide in your office. And, you know, you really can't wait for the world to find you um, because the world's busy and there's TikTok and all other kinds of crap out there that's very right. distracting. But, um, and by the way, don't play the game that everybody else is playing. I mean, you know, all these people like TikTok. I mean, you're not going to get on and wiggle in front of the camera. No, no. <laughs> you know, wiggle just so somebody will look at you for five seconds. That is not the appropriate place for you to be. You know, LinkedIn and, you know, there's other places that is more appropriate. Um, I, I do want to tell you, uh, you know, Ben Glass, who's a lawyer. Oh yeah. No, like ben was, Ben was in one of our, one of my coaching programs one day. And I remember this very, um, clearly we were talking about how you introduce yourself. We were actually talking about the 33 second, uh, elevator speech. Right. Right. And, and folks, um, this was great advice. He said, look, I'm a lawyer, but if I meet someone and tell them I, I'm a lawyer, they're all going, who cares? Oh yeah. <laughs> He said, he said, but if I say to them, well, I'm a coach for my 13 kids. And, you know, he said, if I do this personal intro first, he said, I become more human and more approachable. And then I tell him I'm a lawyer. He said, because if you tell them you're you're a lawyer first, they immediately dislike you and distrust you. (laughs) And he said, so me bragging about me coaching you know, for all these young kids that I voluntarily coach for, and he, he's even part of some organization now. So I recommend that all of you think about, uh, like if you're a motorcycle enthusiast or, you know, whatever it is that you introduce yourself, well, first and foremost, you know, I love yeah. motorcycles, but I also, for a living to pay for this big thing, yeah. you know, I am this. Yeah. So, and, you know, and, and and don't say you sell life insurance because nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> my my joke when I used to travel all the time, 100 cities a year, and I'd sit next to people. And when people would, you know, try to have a conversation and you talked all day and you don't want to talk, I'd always say, they say, what do you do? And I'd say, oh, I'd say life insurance. I'd say, Just shut up. Shut nobody up. ever said another word to me. <laughs> the only better thing was the IRS, but I never looked like an IRS person. <laughs> no, no. Hey, 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 Lee, we were we were going to do about 45 minutes here. And we're, I think, already eight or 10 minutes over our uh, time limit. We could, uh, as we've done many times, talk for three or four hours without without uh, taking a beat. But I want to be respectful of your time. And so uh, we, we probably should wrap it up. The uh, you have a great, uh, you know, several uh, great contributions in my new book. And the and, and the book is mostly about brass tacks, hardcore focused, mar- you know, marketing. It's about how to focus on how to market on LinkedIn, how to market on Facebook, how to do direct mail, how to do websites and one thing or another. But your contributions are all about mindset. And my my early contributions in my own book, I, you know, uh, 
uh, the early part of the book is all about how to stand out, be different, and think differently ab about the world. And I think we've hit both ends of those in a, in a fairly good way today. It's, it's been extremely valuable. Yes. Um, and, and what I contribute to the book is that abundance is a mindset. Um, there, if you really look around you, the most unexpected people can be completely wealthy and successful. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, uh, you can't judge a book by its cover. And that all of us really are creating our reality every day, really by our thoughts and our projections, but really more important of what actions we're taking. And I think a lot of people just right now, uh, their mindset has been so polluted by the overwhelming, overarching negativity of the world. There's almost this feeling that I'm discerning of what's the point. Mm -hmm. But there is a point because when we pull out of this mess that we're in, yep. they're going to be they're going to be people who have risen to the top. And they've done it by consistency, by following certain principles, by doing things other people really will not do. But the mindset is you got to wake up every morning excited to be of service to people. And that when you have that energy, that it will feel very clean to people. But don't just wait for the phone to ring. Do something. And, and, and I, I, before we go today, I just want you to know, as you mentioned, I was on television. Yep. The reason I got on television is I was so poor when I first started my business. I had no money for advertising, but I did figure out that I was very good on television, very good on the radio. I wasn't afraid of any of that. And so I offered my, my advice and services to radio stations, TV stations, newspaper, magazines. And every month in my hometown, I would send out a uh, a letter to these people. of like, if you're looking for productivity or you're looking for stress or anything, I got so much PR that I actually got picked up by someone who actually paid me for it. But for all of you out there, remember, there's a lot of ways you can promote yourself. People love to do business with people they saw on TV or they heard or they read in the newspaper and it's free. Yeah. It's free. If I remember, if I remember correctly, didn't, weren't you interviewed on like 500 different radio stations on, uh, on just been, on Blitz? Uh, I, yes, I was. Uh, I had advertised in a thing called, um, let's, it, it was like, I can't even think of the name radio of it. It was TV how to get on radio. Radio uh, TV interview report or something. Yes, I, I advertised on that. I did yeah. over 500 in my career, I've probably done around 1700 interviews. Mm -hmm. And some of those have actually been to ching, you know, yeah. where something happened that really put me in front of a lot of people. I gained a lot of new clients and there are clients everywhere. If you just decide I'm going to scan the landscape of my reality and I'm specifically looking for and know what your avatar is you're looking for. Like I know that I really don't want to work with people who are working at IBM, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the grunt work thing, they're never going to buy me. They can't afford no. me. They're not going to listen to me. Yeah. But entrepreneurs, business owners, those are the people I resonate with, I'm aligned with, we see reality in the same way, I can be of great service. So you, you just have to really start to decide, this is who I want to work with. And it's, there's kind of magic that will happen once you are, when you have clarity like that. You bet, you bet. Hey, well, we better call it a day. I, I really appreciate the uh, time. I don't want to be disrespectful of your time here. Uh, but it's been uh, fun. Yeah, it's been it's been a, a a great time. And I'll remind everybody, you have a new book coming out. We have a, a few of your books on the shelf there. A few of which I mail out to our clients as a as, yes, as, as free gifts on a regular basis. And my uh, new book, Journey Marketing for Financial Advisors, is soon to be available everywhere. It, it certainly will be available through our website, Advisor Wealth Mastery. Thank you so much for your time, Lee. Thank you so much. And everybody, please get Stephen's book. It, I promise you, it will make you money. It will make you have confidence and it will make you feel more rewarded for what you do in life because you're going to have clear, concise directions that are proven and repeatable. Thank you, Lee. Thank you.